I'd like to welcome all of you. And um, first of all, my name is Anahita Rezai on behalf of Centrum Ciprova uh, and uh, uh, Centrum Ciprova Foundation team. I'm thrilled to welcome all of you to the sixth edition of Open Education Policy Forum 2021, streamed online from Warsaw. And I hope that um, our internet connection won't fail us and we will have a great meeting without any disruption. Um, apart from that, um, if I just can check on a Zoom, um, we are now, we have nearly 40 participants, which is really great. Um, and thank you for being with us and share this time with us. Um, I also like to um, start with, um, with, with the round of uh, uh, thanks for our sponsors, the William and Hewlett um, Foundation, Open Society Foundation, and also our partners uh, who made this event come to this stage as it is today. Uh, and we'd like to thank Comuni Association, Intellectual Property Institute, OE Global, and Otwarte uh, Zasobe, and all of our supportive team in Centrum Cyfrowe. Thank you so much to all of you. And uh, just to save the time, I'm just gonna hand it over to um, Magda Biernat and Alexandra Janus, our co-directors of Centrum Cyfrowe, for the short introduction to our event. Uh, and then we will pass the voice to Ola Czetwertyńska, our head of open education. Um, and then we will move on to our agenda. So um, Ola, Magda, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Anahita. And uh, hello and welcome everybody. Uh, I am very happy and honored to, to be able to open this sixth Open Education Policy Forum. And I also love the fact that its main theme is, is defined as universe of openness. And I hope we will be looking towards the, the post-pandemic, bright post-pandemic future during, during our discussions uh, and workshops. Um, and I think, and I'm sure that the global pandemic has radically changed the way we live and also the way we learn. And it has been a struggle for many of us, but today I would like us to focus on what we can learn from this experience. And as often happens, the experience of crisis can also serve as a window of opportunity when our usual ways um, of working, living and doing things and also learning are questioned or limited. And then we start to experiment. And sometimes the periods of crisis allow us to overcome the crisis of imagination. Uh, so I hope these conversations uh, during this sixth Open Education Policy Forum will bring us closer to the shared universe of openness that we can all collectively inhabit. And I wish you a fruitful discussions. And I hand it over to Magda Biernet. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ola. Can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, it's a great hon honor and pleasure for me to be here today with you. I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of Centrum Cyprova Foundation, who is organizing this conference, but also on behalf of Copyright for Education Comunia team. I've had the pleasure to work with uh, this year on European study remote education during the pandemic. Thank you all very much for being with us. Uh, I hope uh, you will have a wonderful time today and some of you tomorrow, that we will all inspire each other and exchange uh, wonderful ideas. And I hope, I really hope that after the forum, uh, we will be all better equipped for our common policy work uh, in the area of open education no matter on which level, regional, national, European, or international. So have a great time. Thank you for being with us. And Ola, the floor is now yours. Um, thank you very much. 
Um, I'm uh, also very, very happy that I can be here and I will hear this um, premiere of Freeport. And I'm so happy there are so many people here. But what I want to say most that I, I think that for us, also for practitioners as I, because I'm working with teachers um, every day, it's very important to talk about um, education and open education uh, based on data and evidence. And I know that after this, uh, almost two years of remote education, we all have some experience in, in it as a students, as a teachers, parents, sometimes employers or co-workers. And we have a lot of uh, interesting, great stories uh, about remote education and how this open education works in, uh, in remote education. Uh, but right now we also need this uh, hard proof this proof that uh, uh, open education is important for better remote or not education. And, um, and I hope, I truly believe that uh, re reports like this help in this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, I have to, I'm not unmuted. Okay, great. Okay, so I think we can move on uh, from now and just go to the, our agenda. So let's, um, let's have a look at uh, our agenda. We will begin um, the session with the premiere of our latest report, Remote Education During the Pandemic, Teacher's Perspective, uh, with our keynote speakers, uh, Magda Biernat, Dr. Maja Bogataj, Teresa Nogre, and Dr. Alek Tarkowski. Um, then we will move on to the lightning talk session with our guest speakers and our four team member, Kamil Siewowski, will moderate this part for us. But I just want to mention some technical um, and practical uh, information for, for all of you. So as you may already notice, um, we are just recording this session so we can then stream it on our um, YouTube channel. Um, although it's quite impossible <laughs> that you will cap we will capture you because uh, all of you, as I can see, have uh, muted voices um, and you will not be um, on screen. But if you're not comfortable with that, just please turn your camera off. Um, I would be really grateful for that. And please remember that the chat space is absolutely yours. It's, it's the place where you can just share your juicy thoughts, comments, suggestions, any input that you wish to contribute and to share with others. So um, I think we are ready to just pass on and move uh, with our agenda and start um, our premiere of the report. So Magda, again, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anahita. Let me just upload the presentation. One second. Okay. Uh, can you now hear my presentation? Uh, see my presentation? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so uh, during the next 40 minutes, we will be we will do our best to present the most important findings, conclusions, and recommendations on, 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 from our study. Uh, we conducted the study in a team of two excellent and experienced copyright lawyers, Teresa Nobre and Maya Bogatai and two sociologists, uh, Alek Tarkovsky and myself, with enormous help from Anahita Rezai, the coordinator of the study, and Agnieszka Urbańska, also sociologist, uh, who was responsible uh, for data, data collection and data analysis. I will start uh, by describing very briefly the methodology of the study, and I will give you uh, some useful information, background information, and then I will show you a few diagrams and charts uh, uh, with our key findings. Uh, later, I will pass the floor to Teresa Nobre and Maya Bogatai. They will uh, put uh, the key findings into broader perspective by telling us about uh, our conclusions and recommendations. And afterwards, uh, Alek Tarkovsky will try to summarize uh, our presentation. At the end, we will answer a few questions from the audience. So let me uh, start with um, methodology of our study. Uh, so uh, 
uh, report and uh, the, the, the presented report and recommendations are based on European questionnaire based study. The study covers teachers from primary, uh, lower secondary, or upper secondary education. And we carried out this, the survey in seven countries, including Poland, uh, Greece, Portugal, Slovenia, Czech Republic, Germany, and Italy. Our goal was to collect at least 100 answers from each country, but at the end, the total sample size was almost uh, 1,700 answers, and our responders were selected through non-random sampling. The final report, diagrams, charts, questionnaires in eight uh, language versions, also spreadsheets with collected, collected data, are all available on the website de dedicated to the study. The link will be available just after our presentation. All materials we created, uh, I mean here uh, the, uh, the, 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 the report, the diagrams and so on, are available under a CC0 uh, license, so public domain dedication. So you can copy, you can modify, you can distribute, communicate, and make them public uh, without asking permission. Okay, so uh, well, Magda, overall, uh, yeah? sorry to interrupt you, but we can't see your presentation. So you, you can't you, see. Yeah, so I think you need to like uh, stop sharing screen and then try again so that we can follow the yes, slide. Exactly. I just wanted to thank you, Ella. Thank sorry. you. Yeah, once again. Can you now see the presentation? Yes, yes now, it's, now it's on. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, um, let me uh, go back to the, to the presentation. The aim of our study was uh, to uh, shape copyright policies uh, as well as programs uh, that support the development and founding of public educational content and platforms. And we hope that our findings and recommendations will be useful for shaping good, resilient, and open um, public policies regarding uh, all types and shapes of uh, remote education. Okay, so let's uh, go to the section number two, key findings. Um, let me present you uh, just a few key, key findings. Uh, and please remember that this is only a very smart part of them. And uh, you will find the rest in our report on the website, uh, on the website dedicated to this study. So on, the, on this slide, uh, we present the data about the usage of free and uh, paid digital resources during the time of uh, remote education. And uh, it turns out that almost Every teacher in seven surveyed countries uh, have used freely available unpaid resources during the time of remote education, 96% on average, which is not really surprising. But uh, this number drops uh, significantly when it comes to paid subscription-based resources. Only 35% of teachers have used them um, uh, on a regular basis uh, during the time of remote education. My second slide is about the usage of freely available digital resources. And among uh, freely uh, available um, digital resources, uh, videos posted on Facebook, uh, on, sorry, on YouTube uh, and other websites uh, were definitely the most popular type of teaching ads. On average, more than eight in 10 teachers have used them, uh, followed by images from Google search uh, results. Uh, on average, six in 10 teachers use these materials, but uh, in general, 71% uh, of teachers have used freely available images, either from Google search, results uh, from free banks of images such as Flickr, Wikimedia Commons, and others. Also, uh, we discovered that uh, the longer the period of remote education, the more often teachers use non-commercial sources of materials. For instance, uh, when the period of remote education was shorter than, uh, than six months, 
31% uh, of teachers used websites created by public institutions versus 55% um, uh, 52 sorry percent when the period was longer than uh, 12, 12 months and we observe the same when it comes to for example wikipedia 28% up to 6 months and 46% uh, over 12 months also uh, websites uh, created by cultural institutions 30% versus 45% and <laughs> Websites created by uh, non-governmental organizations, 23% uh, versus 36%. Uh, 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 but we don't observe such tendency when it comes to other sources, other commercial sources used during the time of uh, remote education. Okay, uh, so let me uh, go to the next slide about resource creation and uh, resource uh, modification during the distance learning. Uh, and to be honest, uh, it's one of my favorite findings. Um, we find out that during the remote education, teachers have massively used resources created or modified by themselves or their colleagues more than nine out of 10 teachers on average. 85% of teachers, and you can, uh, as you can see on the chart, 85% of teachers uh, preferred materials by themselves and 65% used uh, resources elaborated by uh, their colleagues. Also, um, more than half of teachers on average have heard about the concept of open educational resources, 52% uh, 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 to be exact. Uh, we asked this question about open educational resources twice because this information was very important for us. And this high level of awareness uh, is further confirmed by additional question. Af uh, uh, after being exposed to a simple definition, very simple uh, definition of open educational resources, as you can see on the slide, uh, open educational resources, yeah, to the definition, 54% uh, of teachers claim that they have regularly used this type of resources during the time of remote education, which is in my opinion, very, very optimistic. Um, yeah, so uh, about facing copyright related issues, uh, it turns out that um, more than half of teachers on average have experienced problem with copyright related issues while uh, teaching, teaching remotely. And the most common problems were lack of access to the work because uh, the work was uh, demanded uh, because it demanded payment and uh, the second one was the lack of knowledge whether it was legal to use the resources or not uh, in general problems related to access were indicated by uh, 37 percent of teachers on average and the uh, problem and problems related to knowledge was indicated by um, 26 percent of teachers and uh, my last slide uh, is about um, tools and platform usage during the, the, the pandemic. Uh, actually, 97% uh, of teachers in surveyed countries have used platforms that enable live online classes. So uh, the, this would be called synchronous education. And these platforms are commercial tools delivered by the biggest uh, American tech companies like Google Classrooms, 31% uh, of uh, on average, Microsoft Teams, 41%, Cisco WebEx and Zoom up to 53%. But the popularity of platforms enabling this uh, synchronous education differs significantly among the countries. Microsoft Teams were absolutely popular in Poland. Here in Poland, 78% of teachers use the Microsoft Teams on a regular basis. And in Czech, uh, in Czech Republic, 59%. Um, at the same time, Google Classrooms were very popular in um, Italy, 71% of teachers using them, uh, used them, and Portugal, 57%. Other platforms, Zoom, Cisco WebEx, were popular in Germany, Greece, and Slovenia. 
So uh, this was my last slide. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now, Teresa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Can you can you keep this? Oh, OK, perfect. Yeah. You can keep the slides. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Um, so um, there's there's interesting things coming up from these results. And some of those things we we already at int, even uh, some countries had done um, just on a, on a national basis, some, some sort of surveys that um, helped us understand that was some sort of direction uh, that we then saw uh, um, that was also happening uh, in these countries that we surveyed. Um, but but I will, we will divide these conclusions in terms of copyright um, conclusions and recommendations, and also OER and platforms and collaborative networks. So I'll focus first on the on the ones on copyright, and and one thing that comes up uh, 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 very clearly from from these results, and and we would imagine that in the rest of the European countries. Um, the situation is the same, but of course, we only have seven countries analyzed. But what is very clear uh, from these results is that teachers use content that is not primarily intended to the educational market. So they definitely, you know, at least during this uh, uh, pandemic and remote education period. So I, I recall that we analyzed 12 months uh, and 12 months where teachers were uh, in uh, uh, conducting remote education activities. Uh, so during this period, they favored uh, not only copyright materials um, that were not uh, uh, um, intended for the educational market, but also copyright materials that were freely available online without payment. And this, of course, might be for various reasons. And, and we ask some of the, we ask some questions that help us see some of those reasons. But of course, we didn't conduct interviews, so uh, we cannot be entirely sure about all of those reasons. So one of the reasons that, of course, uh, comes up is uh, uh, the fact that the resources, the, the resources that uh, primarily uh, target the educational market are subject to payment and um, payment was an issue. So we asked teachers really, uh, is, is payment one of the obstacles uh, uh, to access materials? And of course, many of them said, yes, payment is an issue. Um, and when, uh, when the, um, the resources were made available by the companies on the websites of platforms without payment, because we know that that happened during the pandemic. Of course, the number of teachers using those types of standard educational resources doubled. So instead of 20% using regularly used paid or subscription based works, we saw that uh, when those uh, uh, commercial, when that commercial content was available online, uh, 14%, so double the number of teachers uh, started using it. Although, I mean, this is of course relevant, but we should bear in mind um, that it's still uh, far from the numbers that we saw in terms of uh, freely available resources that are online without payment. So we saw, and, and as uh, uh, Magda mentioned, 96% of the teachers said that they regularly use these types of work. So it's still, uh, you know, it's still a, a, a very significant uh, difference um, between, uh, between those resources that are intended to the educational market and that are not intended to the educational market. Furthermore, we also learned that more than 80% of the teachers were creating recourses, resources um, and, and sharing and using those resources in their educational activities. So uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, so this is basically the same. So you can, you can go to the next one. Sorry. Uh, so in one hand, teachers were using content that uh, were not primarily targeting the education market, so content that was not commercial per se. And 
Uh, on the other side, we also went to check uh, which types of use the, the, the teachers were making with, with those copyrighted materials. And what we found out was something that I think we all also already knew is that teachers were using materials online the same way or, um, you know, of course, with, with, with differences that are inherent to being online, but mostly trying to replicate uh, 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 the, um, the face to face environment. So things like displaying audiovisual materials during class or a YouTube video or playing audio materials or including the materials in exercises and presentations. So this, these were the types of things that, you know, the vast majority of teachers were doing. And we know, you know, this, these are the types of things that you do uh, mostly in, uh, uh, in synchronous teaching. Of course, exercises, you also use it um, outside of the, of the live classes. But uh, we, would, we would suggest that most of these uses would not likely undermine the sales because they, they didn't even imply uh, um, making a, a permanent copy of the materials, right? You are uh, just making temporary copies, uh, if any, or in the case of displaying materials from a YouTube, you know, it's just what you need to, to see the material and then there's no permanent copy or uh, at maximum doing copies of small parts, you know, to including exercises and presentations, etc. Of course, uh, teachers also share materials with students, uh, and they did that uh, through clouds, through emails, other platforms. And when they do that, we can, of course, ask if that has an impact on the market. And of course, there, the risk is higher, because when you share a material, you might be sharing um, a copy, an actual copy of the material, but that's not necessarily the case. So uh, I would also like to highlight that 47% of the teachers said that they regularly send their students links to resources by email or social media. So when I send the link, I'm not affecting the market, I'm not creating another copy. Um, it should also be said that we didn't ask how much of the materials the teachers were sharing. So. Uh, when we say sharing materials and they answered, yes, we are sharing, doesn't mean that they are transmitting an entire copy. It could be just an article, a chapter, etc. And also very important, it doesn't mean that they are sharing someone else's materials. It could be their own materials because as we saw 80% or more than 80% were creating their own resources. So with that in mind, and I will ask uh, to go to my, my last slide, um, what the, the takes that we can take from, from here is uh, when thinking about the right to use copyrighted materials for educational purposes, policymakers have to bear in mind that educational activities, at least during remote education during the pandemic, did not revolve around textbooks or other copyright materials primarily intended for the educational market. What we saw is that teachers, when teaching remotely, they prefer to create their own resources or repurpose for education a variety of mostly freely available works that are not intended for the educational market. And, and I think this is a very important piece of evidence because every time that we go uh, to a copyright debate asking for a broader uh, protection of the use of copyrighted works in education, uh, the publishers always claim that uh, we are going to impact the educational market and the market for, uh, uh, for materials that are intended uh, uh, for that market. But what we, are, we have seen, and I mean, Ours was focused again on remote education during the pandemic, but we have seen other studies in Finland, in, Aus in Australia, outside of the pandemic that have also shown the same, is that teachers are really using things that are copyrighted, yes, it's a picture, it's a video, but it's something else that is not targeting this material. It's, it's really uh, uh, being used secondarily uh, for education. So uh, we think there is no, support to say that um, these uses are capable of replacing or affecting the market for those materials. 
and mostly those that market doesn't exist because it's not the target market for those materials so uh, I, we would suggest that this is this strong evidence uh, goes in the direction of recommending broadening the existing legal framework of exceptions and limitations for the use of copyrighted materials in educational activities. And more importantly, uh, and something maybe new for, to what we have been talking and discussing for many years, we think that this supports creating a specific non-remunerated education exception for materials that are freely be freely available online. So Singapore is considering this. Uh, we think that many other countries and specifically Europe could also consider that, taking into account uh, the types of uses and the types of resources that we saw here. Thank you. So I'll hand over to, to Maya Bogataj. Thank you very much, Teresa. I kindly ask Magda to continue to share the slides to save them some time. Um, it resonates the last uh, conclusion and recommendation that Teresa just made. I'm sure it resonates in the ears of everyone who is deeply involved in the implementation process of copyright directive currently in Europe, but I'm sure also uh, wider for, uh, to everyone who is thinking about copyright reform. But let's continue with additional uh, conclusions and recommendations, I will mention three more. And the first one is, and uh, for all, everyone who is, who is worried that the slide presentation on the screen is uh, maybe too small, the slides will be shared on the, webs on, the, on, the, on the website of this project as well. Magda already confirmed that during this presentation. So the next conclusion and conclusion is that Teachers in formal collaboration networks played a significant role during the pandemic and constitute one of the key pillars of online teaching. So it is important to support them on many levels. It's important to stress that teachers share materials and also knowledge. Regarding materials, 90% of teachers on average have used resources created or modified by themselves or by their colleagues. Teachers used these materials much more often than those created by commercial publishers, institutions, and organizations. So it's a huge difference. It is also very important to stress that more than 50% of teachers, 54% to be precise, who participated in the survey regularly use open educational resources while teaching online. Regarding knowledge, Teachers rely on their colleagues. Other teachers were the first source of help when problems occurred. For instance, source of helping regarding copyright related issues as well. So other teachers, school as well, only in 10% teachers relied on the Ministry of Education, for example, or other formal education institutions. So it is very important to support teachers in formal collaboration networks. And we can, we can do, or policymakers or whoever is conducting the policy can do that on many, many levels. For example, by building suitable tools that enable cooperation and content sharing, by reducing legal uncertainties which can prevent teachers from creating and modifying materials, by reducing barriers to online resources, like reducing uh, like licenses or paywalls, and by supporting the development of cooperation and exchange competencies among teachers. That would be one conclusion and, and one recommendation that I've been um, um, mandated to present today. The second one is that teachers mostly depend on tools delivered by the biggest tech companies. Magda already did uh, the percentage of how, how, how this is distributed. So it is crucial to make sure that open and free cooperation, collaboration, co-creation and exchange are possible without dependence on commercial platform providers. 99% of teachers that participated in the service used tool, tools enabling live lessons provided by big four American vendors, namely Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, Zoom and Cisco WebEx. Magda already uh, offered more data on that. 
So preventing large companies from abusing their market power is a relevant matter in education as well. So it is important to make sure that tools by education sector in European countries enable teachers open and free cooperation, collaboration, co-creation and exchange without any restriction caused by used technology and without dependence on a narrow range of commercial solutions. Survey also shows that on average teachers use almost five different tools or platforms while teaching online and the number increased with the time engaged in online education. Survey also shows that was already highlighted by Teresa and before Magda as well that teachers actively reuse and repurpose content from available sources. So building Future-proof, highly quality and resilient online education requires tools that are in line with teachers' educational practices. That means open and free cooperation, collaboration, cooperation and exchange without any restriction caused by use technology and without dependence on a narrow range of commercial solution is necessary. So digital education plan in Europe already addresses these issues, at least we think so, because the development of high performing digital education system is very high on their priorities. This should entail developing public educational, educational infrastructure that supports educators and learners across Europe. It is also important to monitor and not just monitor, if necessary, also to regulate the collection of data and its use by commercial vendors. This possibly means also that new business models and infrastructure provided by commercial vendors should not hinder open education and or public interest in education. That's also very important. And the last conclusion and recommendation coming from me, and this is also like the last recommendation from the report or finding and the recommendation, the remote education was to a great extent supported by open educational resources. More than half of the teachers use OER on a regular basis. More than half of the teachers that participated in the survey. So it is crucial to ensure further development of policies supporting the development of high quality open resources and practices. More than 50% of survey teachers used OER. The data shows immense spread and rise in recognition of OER in the last decade. Only 22% of teachers use digital versions of commercial textbooks. And we know that during the online, the pandemic and forced online education, many commercial vendors or providers of textbook offered free use for at least for a certain time or period of time. It is also important to highlight that only less than 20%, 17% used web pages and educational platforms created by commercial com companies. So, and it's important to say that the longer the period of remote learning, the greater number of teachers have heard about the concept of open educational resources and use them. So they, get, they got more and more popular. And in many, cases, of course, OER were created thanks to policy efforts and programs aimed at the development of the various aspects of open education in the past. Um, and so, and these OERs were introduced at national levels or pan-European levels. So it is important that this is developed also in future to go further and deeper is the expression that li I like in this context. context. So, um, it, it is important that the European Union con should continue to work on opening up education. And uh, this is European Union's initiative uh, as a part of the current digital education plan as well. And this is necessary in order to ensure an accessible and interoperable content layer as part of the digital education system. Responsibility lies also on European member states. We, they should develop robust policies aimed at ensuring open licensing of publicly funded educational resources and at developing educational platforms that make this content available for use. It is also important that op opening up education as an, as an European initiative, initiative should also concentrate on opening up data collected 
by commercial vendors and ensuring that provision of commercial infrastructure for teaching does not hinder open education and our public interest in any way. So a lot of work is waiting for us. And this survey offers some important data to show how to go deeper and further on this aspect. So this would be three highlights from me, uh, three uh, conclusions and recommendations. Um, they are all available on, in the report that will be available on the website immediately after this, um, this presentation. So I give the word now back to Magda. I think we can, we can pass on to the Alec. Uh, so Alec will start his part and Magda, uh, I will ask you to just go to the next slide for, for Alec, thank you. Alec, the floor is yours. Uh, greetings everyone. Uh, I was asked to summarize the results, but I think what I will rather try to do is put them in the perspective because the summary has already been given. And I think it's, um, the results are very clear as presented by my colleagues. I want to start by saying, repeating, I guess, but this is really important for us that as, as uh, Comunia members, we are providing evidence. You know, this kind of research is needed, not just on copyright. Uh, as Ola said, uh, we really all think we understand how education worked in the pandemics because we experienced it as, uh, you know, parents, friends of people who have children, teachers, and so on. Uh, we need to build policies on evidence, and I'm very proud that as uh, Comunia, uh, a relatively small organization, we're doing work that I honestly don't see being done by big educational systems uh, and, and major stakeholders. I So maybe that's one summary. Let's try to do more of this work. Uh, we managed to do uh, seven countries. It would be great to have such a study for all of Europe or actually a, a lot of the world. Um, and to do that regularly. And I'm, I, I know I acknowledge that there are many studies happening, but I think we especially need this detailed knowledge, this detailed knowledge on use of content and also of tools. This is, by the way, interesting. I will return to that. I think several years ago, we would say we're really interested in how content is used in education because that's what we need for an open education debate. I think with this study, we try to show that, saw, uh, show that other issues are very relevant around the use of tools, services, and platforms. Um, another thing I want to point out, and we've been repeating that through the Copyright for Education project, uh, copyright is usually framed as a matter of creativity, of art, of supporting creators. Uh, obviously, copyright has a much broader effect. We've been saying that for a long time in, ed in education, it's obviously not reduced to creators. Yes, teachers are creators, but let's also acknowledge them as simply educators who have their needs uh, and the learners also have needs and the copyright needs to work for them. Um, but I think when we look at this study, we see that um, legal systems like copyright are even more. I think they are infrastructure. Uh, I think the infrastructure debate became something really important during the pandemic. Uh, we understood that there are a lot of systems we need to uh, care for. And there are beautiful essays I recently uh, read by an American engineer called Deb Chatra. He, she writes basically that infrastructures are ways in which we care for each other in a society. And I find this uh, both deeply moving and deeply convincing. And educational systems are such infrastructure, be they schools in real life, so-called, or schools in the virtual world, so-called. They're basically one and the same. And I think this is what we try to grasp uh, with this study. You know, there is a lot of talk of digital transformation being needed in education. I think it's a, in a way a grand term, uh, but it's also very true. Uh, we learned a lot about this digital education uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and I think right now we're in a point where we need to be careful that we uh, benefit from these learnings. Uh, we don't know what the future will bring. Remote education might continue, and then we really need to learn these lessons. But even if we return to a mode where children go to physical schools, I hope that some learnings about how to do digital education from the pandemic stay with us and how to support it, for instance, as is our focus with proper uh, copyright laws and approaches. And uh, as I said, digital transformation sometimes sounds so big that it actually doesn't mean anything. I think, and, and we've been speaking about it, we should really try with three things. Um, one is paying attention to good copyright. This is uh, the core of our work at Copyright for Education project. 
Second is supporting OER. This study is really amazing in showing how broad awareness of uh, uh, open education, open educational resources is. Uh, even if we take into account that maybe our uh, sample was not ideal, really these are these are very big numbers. And I think the pandemic has to do with it. People really, uh, for sure in Poland, but I think all over the world really came into contact with these resources and understand their specificity. And of course, the way to do it is basically all around the world. We need to pay attention to the UNESCO recommendations, which I think are a key agreed upon global document uh, in support of open education. Um, and the last thing I think we really need to pay attention to supporting teachers. There's a, a really good comment uh, in chat that with the digital tools, uh, teachers plus technology basically did what governments should be doing. I think it's a fair analysis. Uh, uh, this shows amazing work by teachers, amazing creativity, but also amazing effort uh, and often stress. I think something that is uh, probably not acknowledged enough and certainly not uh, paid enough attention in policies. Um, by the way, at the Centrum Cyfrowe, an organization where I worked for a long time uh, and I still support as a member of the board, we always felt that um, open education is not just about licensing, not just about content. It's a lot about supporting cooperation by simply people. And I know this is, um, I think, a mood that's shared by a lot of people in the open education movement. So I hope this last recommendation really receives some traction. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alec. Um, so uh, now the time has come to um, to our uh, Q&A session. So we have uh, some question that you just posted on the chat. So let me just uh, start just with the um, first question uh, from Werner Westerman, uh, which is direct to Teresa. Um, could Teresa extend on what is a non renumerated ex educational exception and how would that work? So, um, Teresa, if you just can, um, if you want, I can repeat the and uh, the question. So, uh... it's great. Thank you, and I hate I understood. Um, cool. Thank you. So can you hear me? Right. So, thank you for the question. So, um, let me just first then clarify what is a, a remunerated and non-remunerated exception for education. So. Um, when you want to use a copyrighted work without having to ask permission to the copyright owners, um, you can only do it if there is an exception in place. I, I think that's the concept of exception and I hope that all of you are familiar with it. Um, and that's great, of course, because imagine every time a teacher wanted to use um, a, an article from a newspaper or a famous picture or photograph, if it had to ask permission, it would be uh, very difficult to convey teaching. And, and then these exceptions in some countries are not subject to compensation. So you don't have to ask permission and you don't have to pay for it. In other countries, they are subject to compensation. So you don't have to ask permission, but you have to pay for it. Um, what we are, uh, what we have uh, uh, proposed, and and this is in line with, as I said in the most recent uh, reform, copyright reform in Singapore. That's what the government proposed. In the in Australia, they are also discussing something similar. Is that uh, specifically for content that is freely available online? So content is is that is not against that is not behind any paywall. So if you go to YouTube, you can access. If you go to a website of a company, you can see the, the picture, you know, something that you don't have to pay to access, um, even if it's not licensed with an open license. Okay, so things that are online without requesting payment for you to access them. Those types of content we are uh, um, what we we propose is that you can use those for education without having to pay for it basically because if the right holder put the content online for everyone to access and see, um, we should assume that there's no interest in, in making a profit out of it, or um, there's only an interest in making a profit out of a platform, a specific platform. So for instance, if, when, when creators put things on YouTube or other social uh, media platforms, um, they expect to monetize that content sometimes and they do and they get paid by YouTube and that's fine. So you either get paid by someone else 
or you don't expect to get paid by the user. So that's the, that's the point. If you don't expect to get paid by the user, why should you be pay, Why should educators, schools, uh, students pay to use it for educational purposes? So that's the rational, and that's why we are proposing to have a specific non-remunerated exception for these types of uses. It could also be that you already have um, permission to use all types of content and you make uh, specifically this content not subject to remuneration. Um, so that's the idea. Great, thank you. Thank you, Teresa. So uh, let's move on to the next question, uh, which is from Martin Olander. Um, and the question I will um, refer to, to Maya. Uh, how exactly are the companies uh, abusing their power? Where is the where is it is this coming from and what research supports um, this uh, this findings maya if you could just um, handle that question thank you very much well the evidence on the abuse of power that would be very direct and concrete i'm not european commission involved in any anti-competition case it was it is just derived from the fact that it's a very oligopolistic situation regarding the provision of tools that teachers use in online education, like 99% of teachers use tools that are provided by four big vendors. So this, this is the observation. And the statement was that, um, that preventing large companies from potential abusing of, of their market power is a relevant matter in education as well. So this should be uh, monitored and regulated by the by the relevant authorities. That was the, the statement. So I hope, I mean, it is more specified in the report. I hope I offered uh, the, 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 the suitable reply. My stress is also, and maybe Teresa or Alec can jump in, is also that com commercial vendors are collecting a massive amount of data and are building new business model around that data. And the, the, what I stressed is also that this should be also relevant for uh, monitoring and possibly also for regulation. We've seen some reports uh, prepared by across the Atlantic, but it's also applicable here in Europe. So this would be this would come from me if Alec or Teresa want to jump in, please. Um, Teresa, do you want to go ahead? I can I can say some things, but go ahead you first. OK, because I'll, I'll comment quickly as well. I, I don't I think the issue is not to frame it that there are abuses. Actually, I think it's the other way around. The availability of these platforms has been extremely important for dealing with the urgent need of remote education. The commercial solutions were there and they were adopted, but they were adopted often by educational systems um, without sort of paying enough attention to the conditions under which they are adopted. And I think now after this, all this time passed, what we need is sort of a, a debate between public educational systems, public institutions, and these commercial providers of platforms on how do we want public education to look like on commercial platforms. I think there's a lot here. Uh, it, it's unfair to sort of put all the responsibility on the side of the vendors. I think it's a lot also on the side of public institutions institutions that don't have sufficient capacity to have these conversations, don't frame the needs of digital education yet in this way, they still think, I don't know, in terms of just digital skills or content. Uh, uh, so I think there's, uh, uh, to be clear, I would frame it simply as a need of a public debate, but there's also importance of, of basically public oversight of these solutions that is very important. Yeah, if I can add very quickly at what Maya said about data, and I think that's a very important issue because we, in the past, we have analyzed at Comunia um, licenses for education, and we haven't analyzed licensing platforms. So that's that's something that we could do uh, going forward. But also, other 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 people are doing that analysis. So what, one thing that also be, has become clear in the past years in the copyright discussions is that. Copyright is less important nowadays than um, than data, right? So it's it's really important to ensure that when we move to these platforms, we don't really give a, a power that uh, um, that relates to to uh, to data and um, 
And, and from a copyright perspective, I even see another problem, which is when we rely on these licenses, on, on using these licenses for, or, or sorry, on using these platforms to uh, convey education online, uh, we also are substituting our um, educational activities to terms and conditions of these platforms that in terms of copyright can have an impact on what can you share or not share. So we didn't see evidence that teachers were being blocked massively. Uh, it's really a, a, a small percentage of teachers that reported that they were being uh, prevented from using uh, copyrighted materials on these platforms because of uh, um, algorithms, uh, uh, algorithms detecting that some copyrighted content was being used, although there was an exception and they could use it, right? So I think there's indeed the problem of uh, relying on platforms that have that subject to uh, many, many, many uh, different uh, interests and have to respect many different interests. And this can create, you know, there's a lot of debate, but can create problems with indeed data and and we have the GDPR for that, of course, uh, but but also with uh, uh, potentially filtering content that should not be filtered because uh, you are covered by an exception. So, some ideas. Great, great. Thank you, thank you to all. Um, I will just pass to the last question because um, uh, we will have three questions, and then we will move on. Um, and the last question also is from Martin Olander, and he's asking about popularity of the YouTube materials. Was this just because of access price, or is it also convenience of availability? Um, or um, and then it comes. YouTube has almost everything for everyone in one place with reboosts search. Did you test for that? So I will refer this question maybe first to to Alec. Then you can also pass on and just add something, um, Ferris and Maya. Um, we didn't look in such detail at this issue, um, and I think it's, by the way, very hard to distinguish these two factors, and these two factors uh, are important. Um, I'm sorry, this makes me think of something that's sort of maybe more as an anecdote, but I often used to think that YouTube is the biggest uh, educational classroom, and I think it's a very disruptive thought. Uh, but it's true, I mean, and I, I always wished uh, we could study that and I sort of realized we exactly have this result, right? It's a top result um, in our study and, and for sure it, it, it's a mix, I think, of, um, of price or lack of it and uh, ubiquity and I'm now thinking how to distinguish these two. I don't have a good idea. If you do, please let us know. Maybe we can do further research. Uh, Maya, Teresa, do you want to add something? I will continue with the following addition. During the uh, copyright reform, and also now during the implementation, I, 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 my, I usually talk as somebody who promotes broad and clear exception education and its research. And the sentence that YouTube is not just a market, but it's much more. It's also a place for education was many times, uh, many times came from me. And in this context, it's shocking for me to see the developments that are taking place in Slovenian proposal how to implement um, the, the DSM directive. And I also see similar provisions in German and Austrian Copyright Act, but there they have at least different regulation regarding collective management organization. So in respect to the Article 17, I will just, I will not go broader than that. Uh, there is a special uh, mechanism which, which um, will demand that everyone will uh, pay a special remuneration for every users on platforms. So on YouTube, all the users, also the OER users on YouTube or all, also all the content that's offered under OER, if the platforms will not be specifically excluded from provision of 17 and YouTube will not be, and, you, and YouTube is not just the market, but also a place for education, uh, there will be mandatory remuneration for every possible use. In Slovenia, the, we, we don't have a, we just have proposal. Uh, our Ministry for Commerce listened to the demands of collecting management organizations even more. In Slovenia, every use of audiovisual work on internet will need to be remunerated if the proposal will go through. I mean, the situation is observed. 
observed and the findings that OR is so important and that this is offered also through the commercial platforms that will be regulated by Article 17 is necessary to take into consideration. Europe should, the left arm should know what is doing the, the right arm. Uh, if this study shows something, but I, I prefer the findings on the, on the right of uh, need of broad and, uh, and clear co copyright, uh, copyright exception for education. But on the, on the topics of OIR, it shows that OIR are really, really important. And they are, of course, important because they are simple to use. That, I mean, many times prepared by colleagues that are using similar materials. And the copyright conditions are very clear. But if there will be policies or, or even leg legislation implemented that will hinder this use, this will not um, be a good development in Europe or elsewhere. Um, Teresa. I'm sure you have something to add. I, I, I think we would, I would rather, <laughs> but yeah. there's some other interesting questions, so maybe uh, we need to move on. And so I'm, I'm happy yeah, to move sure, on. Sure, because uh, yeah, there was a request for, from Teresa, so maybe we will finish this question here and just give another five minutes to Teresa to um, answer one of the last question. Um, so I, I would just read it. Uh, I don't know who, who just wrote it so, so far, not mentioning you. Um, I think I understood you said in your introduction um, that the sample uh, used in this report was a non-random sample of more than 1,000 people. I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. Often randomness is used to prevent possible sources uh, of bias. Example, um, probably the close friends of the people on this call have different experience of copyright than the general public. So a sample of our friends would be a bit problematic. Teresa, pass on you. And if you'd be kind to just ask, answer in five minutes, I would be grateful. Thank you. I, I actually think Magda is the best person to answer to this. Um, but I, I, well, I can talk about Portugal, what we did in Portugal was um, hire an, a researcher that went through different channels uh, and, and, and channels with teachers that were not uh, our friends or, or uh, so there was no, no such bias. So basically asking the support of uh, different uh, Facebook groups, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, but I think Mike that could, could actually uh, be more, um, helpful in explaining that. So that was the case for Portugal. We, we were not able to, of course, I think in Portugal, we got really a good uh, random number of people. In Poland, the same. We used the, the teachers' unions to, to distribute the, the survey. I add to this because I'm not sure Magda, she has her camera off. Um, OK. Sure that, really, I yeah. can quickly say um, it would be great to do random sampling. Random sampling across Europe basically requires hiring a research firm, which would increase our budget several fold. Uh, this is a matter of capacity. Uh, we nevertheless think that for an exploratory st uh, study like this one, a non-random sample gives valid result. We're very also transparent about the fact how this was designed and there are obvious limitations uh, in terms of pure statistics. Uh, you probably know very well that even with non-random random sampling, uh, I think we're getting a general sense of direction. Uh, of course, the numbers would be different with random sampling. And as I said, more work to be done and hopefully more work to follow. Great, great. Thank you, Alec. Thank you, Teresa, Maya and Magda. Um, so I think we, we can... Um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I can just say that I agree with yeah. Alec. Uh, yeah, that was not a random sampling. Uh, but actually, uh, linked to the, to the questionnaire was sent by our partners from each involved country, mainly using help from teachers union, teachers groups uh, on social media and virus, uh, uh, virus uh, teacher mailing lists. So uh, mainly help from teachers union, uh, like in Poland, for example. Thanks. Or Thank you. Slovenia, for example, teachers interesting or frustrated by the online education that participated in copyright uh, copyright workshops, but contact was done by the academic network to uh, and through principal union. So to every teacher, the only common factor of them was that they were like more uh, more observant or more they were paying attention of where they can learn anything or where they can get any information on this. 
pressing topics that were pressing for them for sure. Great, thank you. Thank you, Maya, so much. Thank you to all of you. Um, and this is this just brings us um, to the next topic. But before that, I just um, remind to all of you that you will find our email contact, mine and, and Magda. So if you have any further questions, you'll feel feel just free to, to contact us and, and just ask question that will pop into your mind. Um, so let's move on uh, to our lightning talk, uh, lightning talk session, which I'm so excited about, and just present um, uh, our agenda for for this uh, for this session. Um, Kamil Shlivovsky from Otwarte uh, Zasowy will moderate this session, and we will start with. Um, uh, seven diverse complex, but due to the time, uh, very short presentation in order as follows. We will have Christian Morgan, then we will have Werner Westerman, then Adina Manea, and then we will move on with Zehluk Rodriguez, Dr. Sibyl Thomas, uh, Dr. Catherine Cronin, and then we will end up with Leo Haverman. So um, I will just pass the voice to Camille, who will moderate this session and just give me some seconds to spotlight you so you will be available <laughs> for everyone. And here we go. Hello, uh, I'm so happy to be a part of this event again. And thank you, Anahita, for invitation and for uh, already giving us the timeline of who will be speaking. I will just give a very brief introduction to this session uh, because uh, when you invited me to this, I thought that maybe after this pretty hard year for all teachers, all educators, all uh, activists doing open education, sometimes we have this moment when we uh, we are losing a bit of faith or a bit of energy in what in our work and i think it's good to like reach out even remotely to people from other countries even to exchange the perspective on challenges mishaps uh, the stuff we are not good at maybe exchange stuff we celebrate but beyond our formal success stuff we celebrate because we we got to the end of the year we still have some energy left maybe we still have uh, something amazing in the future. So I think this is a re-energizing opportunity. It's not only us who chosen the speakers. I'm so happy that those this. I'm, I'm happy to invite uh, Kristen Morgan to be the first person. And you... Just, uh, just all the um, listeners and viewers today, I encourage you to ask questions in the same way we've discussed the previous session. We'll pick one or two uh, quick questions uh, and between the presentations, we'll, uh, we'll try to ask. I will... And, uh, and also, of course, Then okay. you'll, you'll later find a brief and fast. So we'll be, very, uh, we'll be very, very happy if you'll connect with those speakers today and tomorrow. They have uh, amazing things to share beyond those seven minutes. So connect with them and ask them questions even outside of the Zoom and uh, this event. Uh, Kristen, if you're ready, the floor is yours. I hope you can share the screen. And if so, I will be putting the timer on and you will have seven minutes. It's great to see you again. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, I do not have screen sharing ability. If anybody would be able to, to pop that on for me, that would be fantastic. Yeah, Camille, will you do it or shall, shall I do it for Kristen? Give us a second. Okay, okay, no uh, problem. Can you, can you try now? Can you try now or? Yes, thank you. Got it. 
All right, there we are. Well, thanks so much for having me, everybody. And uh, hello, bonjour. My name is Kristen Morgan. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm joining you today from Kelowna, BC, Canada. And I'm on the traditional and unceded lands of the Silks Okanagan people. I have a professional background at the University of British Columbia's Okanagan campus in learning technologies and open education. And as a five term student senator on our highest academic governing body, I'm the vice chair of our academic policy committee. I'm really excited to speak with you today about digital assessment tools, open test banks, and student driven policy development. Digital assessment tool is a term I coined to describe so called pay to play homework systems, especially those owned and operated by textbook publishers. These DAT are repositories of multiple choice, fill in the blank and numerical response questions, all of which are automatically graded by the system. We usually see DAT being used for weekly quizzes in large first and second year classes, and instructors typically have minimal involvement or oversight in the delivery of these quizzes. In addition to tuition and textbook costs, students paid a fee ranging from 75 to 100 Canadian dollars, so about 50 to 65 euro to access these tools. Beyond having a heavy financial burden, digital assessment tools also have significant issues for accessibility, especially for those using adaptive technology and for our international students. For several years, digital assessment tools were a dirty little secret of post-secondary education, especially in North America. Um, in effect, we were charging students above their tuition to get a grade in a class. We knew that open repositories and open test banks existed that were better, more affordable, and more accessible than these digital assessment tools. So why weren't we writing policy to encourage their use? As course delivery rapidly shifted online in March of 2020, I became increasingly frustrated by the lack of action to address the issue. So one evening in April of 2020, I just decided to write down or to sit down and write the policy myself. Over the course of the following months, the newly named policy 0131 was approved at our Senate and came into effect in September of 2020. As a result of really positive feedback from our campus community, we then strengthened the policy through a round of revisions and passed a more comprehensive version, which just came into effect this month of September 2021. Thanks, Dean from UBC Okanagan's Provost Office and BC Campus. The inaugural open education resource grants were also awarded during this time frame. We were really pleased to see a high level of interest from instructors and several projects were focused on creating and adopting open test banks and courses that previously used digital assessment tools. Our digital assessment tool policy is truly for the students by the students. This process showed us that by putting students in position of academic governance, we produce bold and impactful policy work. I'm also extremely proud to share that 0131 is a landmark policy in British Columbia and across Canada, and that several other post-secondary institutions across Canada and the US are currently developing similar policies. So what does 0131 digital assessment tool policy actually do? At its core, this policy is actually quite simple. By default, digital assessment tools may not be used in any UBC Okanagan course. We recognize that such a ban may be challenging for some instructors to implement on a short time frame, especially without supportive funding in place. As a result, we created a process for exemptions to be granted on pedagogical reasons only. If an instructor can demonstrate that their students would be at a large educational disadvantage without the use of a digital assessment tool, the Dean can grant an exemption to this policy for a one year term only. If such an exemption is granted, we set overall limits of 65 Canadian dollars, so about 43 euro, and 15% to the student's overall grade. We intend to phase out such exemptions in two to three years, especially as more open test banks become available and as sufficient technical support is arranged. We're rapidly developing infrastructure in our library, bookstore, and center for teaching and learning to support more instructors as they shift to open forms of assessment. There's certainly a financial and time commitment required from our university for these steps, and uh, we understand and respect that not everything can be developed overnight. Beyond encouraging a shift to open educational resources, 
our digital assessment tool policy has an estimated annual savings of 350,000 to 500,000 Canadian dollars. So about 230 to 330,000 euro on our campus of just 11,000 students. I genuinely can't express how meaningful and encouraging this is for students. Not only are they paying less to access their education, but they can see the university is modernizing its approach to teaching and advocating for cutting edge resources. The motivator for this might have been to save students money, but honestly, in the long run, it's opened up this really wonderful conversation at our university about how we assess students, what we're charging students for, which resources we're choosing to bring into our classes, and especially as learning continues to be online and as that might impact future delivery even after the pandemic restrictions ease. Having these conversations at such a time is really important to encourage folks to adopt open forms of assessment in their teaching. I'd like to quickly wrap up by focusing on three concrete takeaways that I hope you'll take away from my lightning talk today. First of all, as I'm sure is the same for many of you, UBC is in an interesting phase of shifting from primarily grassroots advocacy for open education towards more institutional support. By adopting policies like digital assessment tools, we're able to identify need for open resources and funding for open and start the conversation for policy development with an approachable topic. I'd also like to highlight once more the value of giving students meaningful authority over academic matters. I've been fortunate to volunteer and work in a number of capacities at UBC over the years, and it's only by collecting those experiences that I was able to successfully work on this policy. Beyond just extending student commission, sorry, committee positions to students, I encourage you to elevate their voices to the role of chair and to vice chair and actively seek to empower them to be involved with academic decisions. Finally, I'd like to leave you with a note of encouragement. It only takes one person to make a massive difference. We're all here today to be advocates for open. So be bold, be brave, and don't be afraid to roll out some disruptive innovation. This is my contact information, and I would really love to connect afterwards if any of you are interested in learning more about this policy. Uh, so we have a bit of a time, so I want to ask you one question because you uh, ended on a very positive note with one person being able to make a change. So I wanted to ask if you've seen any shift uh, from students who are not only uh, saving some money uh, due to this policy, but maybe do they ask how they can help? Do you see like, any possibilities for, for people who save something due to this uh, policy to be uh, more than just an activist, maybe some, someone who will be in the future also supporting some other policies? Yeah, you know, there's a there's an anecdote I can share that I really loved that came out of this. Um, this policy really raised awareness for a lot of folks at different levels, students and instructors, about how um, unethical the practices were to charge students to get a grade in their class. What we actually saw on our campus was a group of students come together from one course union, so uh, third and fourth year undergraduate students who were all majoring in the same area. They came together one day and just wrote questions for the first year class uh, and they basically worked together to start the development of an open test bank with the intention of future students having access to it this wasn't institutionally supported and it wasn't given any funding it was just a whole bunch of people who got together one day with tim hortons and their computers and started writing questions we're still not sure where this test bank is going to end up but it was really encouraging to students to see students getting involved right on the ground floor uh, getting their hands into not just open education policy, but the creation of open educational resources and open test banks because they saw how impactful it is on pedagogical and financial levels for all students at our campus. Oh, I see that Camel has some internet connection problems, uh, but I hope that he will join us in a minute. Uh, okay, so let's move on uh, with the next um, speaker. So th thank, thank you so much, Kristen. Um, it was really, really interesting. Um, and then let, let's go uh, right now to Werner Westerman. Um, if I can just kindly ask you to uh, come up and I will just unpin Kristen and then we can move on. With Werner. And hopefully I'm back. And sorry yes, for the you are connection back. lost. 
It's it's okay, Camu. Uh, I just uh, asked Werner to come on, so I hope that he will. If I remember correctly, he yes. has sometimes the most amazing backgrounds uh, uh, for for any meetings uh, because he works at National Library of Congress. But uh, he will probably tell about this more. Hello to everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Well, thank you so much for for the invitation and. Uh, just so excited about the wonderful things that uh, that we're hearing. So uh, we're going to talk today about uh, about an issue that I think it hasn't had the the, the relevance that that it should. And we're talking about uh, we're going to talk about offline OER. And um, and this is a, a very key issue because when we went into the pandemic context uh, in in the that caused this educational disruption, um, we had to make this transit toward digital education. But that digital education was understood as a connected uh, um, uh, distance ed education. And that is something that, that is a big problem, especially in our, our um, less developed countries. Um, this image went viral in March when the school year was starting to, was starting um, to, um, to start in the second year in, uh, with this pandemic disruption. So what we're seeing here is just two kids in a very deserted place in the north of, uh, of Chile that were, they were just looking for a place where they could connect to some type of uh, connectivity um, so they could uh, attend to their classes or online classes. And this photo went viral um, and everybody, you know, kind of shook their head and said, hey, we need to do something about this. And then what we saw is that this problem was all over our country. Um, in, 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 in that, uh, showed us that uh, the connectivity for a, a connected distance education was, we didn't have the basic infrastructure to, to really uh, make this happen. So the struggle for connectivity, I think is a big, big problem in, 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 in our countries. And let me give you a snapshot of what Chile, um, of, of, of the, the connectivity in Chile is, is like, this is a very rough, this is last year's, uh, uh, from last year's data, but the blue section of the pie is in 8% of the population in Chile have the, the a full connectivity type of um, connectivity uh, related to education. We also have to think that uh, connectivity for, uh, uh, for distance education is, is very thorough, you need, very good connectivity to make things happen. So, but only less than 10% of our country is well suited for distance education. That is the main reason why remote education was so, it doesn't have the same impact in learning as, as, as the face-to-face -face, uh, setting. So, so um, by the way, this is the snapshot of Chile being number 33 in the Internet Connectivity Index. It's, it's a global index of how countries have readiness around connectivity. And Chile is in place in number 33. You can think what happens with a country that's in this 100 uh, ranked. Um, so this is a big, big, big problem that we need to address. So in that sense, uh, we thought, hey, we can embrace openness so we can deal uh, and we can adapt the resources so we can make it available offline. So uh, here in Chile, we, we, we said, hey, why don't we build a robust solution around OER uh, for math in fifth into 10th grade? Um, this is due thanks to a, a small Creative Commons fund and in our, um, in our um, 
goal was to make this OER relevant to the, to the Chilean context. So we aligned, we did a, a, a curriculum alignment uh, process to gather OER and align it to the prioritized curriculum. When we talk about a prioritized curriculum, basically is the curriculum was shrinked, uh, which was a very good, very good uh, no, uh, news for us because teachers have to deal with a very extensive content-driven curriculum. Um, and, and we know that we, we need to uh, promote a different kind of education more related to skills and, and, and attitude. So, so when we wanted to do this, uh, when you think about offline OER, you have to deal with Colibri. Colibri is a tremendous project from the Learning Equality Foundation in, in the US. Um, it has a, a lot of years now and it's being deployed very, very extensively. Um, why offline OER? Were they, uh, because there's a lot of uh, contexts that do not have any type of connectivity. So uh, there's a very interesting project, the Colibri, Colibri Fly, where Colibri is used in, in countries in, in Western, uh, in, pardon, Eastern Africa, as well as Jordan. And um, the very exciting uh, findings there. But also it's starting to, to scale uh, in in Central America, um, do so with us um, where some foundations, U.S.-based foundations, are starting to work. So, so I really urge you to to think about uh, in exploring Colibri. But Colibri is not just a learning platform where the teachers and students gathered around these offline resources. They also have uh, this huge content library, which is a, a very excellent um, source where you can reach out to different type of OERs. And, and, and the good news is that this content library has very interactive and media content, very high quality uh, content, such as Khan Academy or the Fed simulations, just a couple examples. But there's many, many uh, sources, many, many in English, although, because in Spanish we We don't hear Werner. I think we're gonna, yeah. Uh, and I hope he did not lose the energy in the yeah, laptop. I think <laughs> he, he just lost the energy of, yeah, uh, of his laptop, of his device. So uh, maybe he will join us. I hope that he will. And then we will have, um, because I, I, as I know, he hasn't finished yet, <laughs> but no, that's but, the tech, but, yeah, the technical things that happen and it's normal and I hope that he will come back to us and then we have the time to just maybe ask him a few questions. Um, but so, somehow he lost the power almost at, after seven minutes. So like, exactly, it's, it's, it, yes. it, 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 it was a sign some kind of, but not yeah, from us. It we... was a sign, <laughs> exactly. Okay, so so just let's move on to, to Adina and that she will, um, yeah, I will just, Spotlight here. Hello, everybody. It's very nice to meet you. Uh, and this uh, is my presentation on another very interesting subject who is not available because of the content, because we are talking about uh, sex education. Um, I hope you are seeing the presentation as it's supposed to be. Not. Uh... Yeah, you can just you can just uh, turn the full screen, and that will be. Yeah, yeah awesome. I'm trying to do that. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, so it's about making sexual education accessible, available, and impa impactful by using open educational resources. I am from Youth for Youth Foundation Romania, which is an NGO uh, established in early in, in yeah in early nineties in Romania. Uh, and uh, nowadays we feel like we are back in time due to the anti-gender speech that is almost of all over the world and making sex education, sexual reproductive health education less and less available. Uh, 
in pandemic time, it should be combined always with health education. But since uh, health education by itself, it was not a priority, uh, we kept with what we were doing and trying to build up some uh, responsible behaviors uh, within young people. What we did was uh, 1200 minutes of synchronous online training for peer educators, young people, to trainers that we were previously trained in order how to work with digital and uh, online and open educational resources. And our main challenge was to make the online experience as interactive as it was supposed to be uh, in offline. These are the themes and the minutes that uh, for each theme, what we saw it was that online increases, doubles the time of uh, training. That was another challenge in order to have two hours, uh, 20 hours of training, we're supposed to put it into weekends, taking into account the breaks necessary for us and for everybody to get up, move a little bit, uh, eat <laughs> and stuff like that, hydrate and all of these things. Of course, we used apps that uh, also the report mentioned as being uh, a, a lot uh, being used broad all over Europe and the world. It was classroom because the, the G Suite and the classroom because they got used to it. Also Zoom and WhatsApp because we needed to communicate a lot. And we paid for some others. Jamboard was free, but Mentimeter, World Wall, Miro and Padlet plus Canva to develop uh, the materials, uh, the informative materials with, uh, were some others. This is how the training design looked like, very different from what we uh, got used to until now, uh, very specific in minutes and who's doing what. These are some examples of how to do the group work, starting from a study case in Jamboard, put them in groups, make them, work together in Zoom rooms and uh, then having the facilitated discussion in the bigger group also on Zoom. This is an, an example of activity on hygiene, sexual and productive health, the, the part of anatomy and physiology. We use the spin. This is the world war on anatomy and physiology, trying to make it interactive, drag and drop. Drag and drop again, uh, put puberty or, uh, I don't know, erection and uh, definitions were uh, in the front. Gender equality, we use Padlet because it was very resourceful to have like a timeline and they discussed between themselves and then uh, come back in the big group for, for females and for males. Another type of how to do mirror and brainstorming and uh, Menti for uh, a type of activity that combines knowledge and attitudes, clarifying some attitudes on HIV AIDS. This is on, again, on violence, on gender and violence. We used Miro because we had some cards already developed that were very nice with study cases and helped us make some trees and some maps like that, let's say. And of course, we put them to be interactive and use some other free apps for them to create, to, to try to make some role plays, but through comics. So, these are materials that are informative done in Canva, in which we used lots of information because, and we put them only after the session was being done, not before the session. But our main challenges, because this is our, our, our main concern, which open license is the most appropriate for this content? For us, it's the most restrictive one at this point because the subject that we are addressing is still a very controversial one 
and we have a strong opposition that takes from the context and makes strange interpretations, even on the right of birth. There are age, age regulations, and uh, the most important thing is that adults and teachers they need their own training on the subject with uh, very entertaining mass media and we do need have to have graphic design a very good structure and combination of methods plus the skills of the trees uh, something to be considerable considerate about and thank you Thank you so much, Adina. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was amazing. And uh, I have one question, uh, if you're still with us. Yes. In, uh, in between the uh, next presentations. So you mentioned at the beginning that this is difficult because of the topic and the topic is difficult. So if I can ask you, do you have any idea of what kind of support other than like with copyright issues, such a topics that you want to make part of an open education and open, open practice, what kind of support those kind of projects dealing with Controversial topics, at least in this in this in this time, what kind of support uh, would be needed for you and uh, similar projects in other countries as well? Can, what can you imagine? What you what you need other than just copyright support? I don't know. We are already thinking about doing uh, asynchronous, non-synchronous training, and make it available as an open educational resource. And we uh, already wrote a project uh, for having that. And uh, what our reflection was, as I've told you, is that we are supposed to be very, very entertaining for, uh, we are competing with YouTube. Yes, we are supposed to be very entertaining and with TikTok, uh, with, our, with our beneficiaries, which are the adolescents. And in the same time, we are supposed to be as decent as possible and understandable as possible by the, the adults. We have to keep the, the very uh, fine line uh, between what to talk about, how much we talk about values. It's not about talking. The, the main challenge was how to make it interactive. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. The controversial subject, the, the, the controversial part is more related to copyright. That's one thing. And the other thing is to have all the materials approved by the institutions in charge. That means the public health and hopefully the education. Even if, if it's in online, it seems that the, it's not that uh, compulsory. Plus, mm -hmm. we want to be very strict in covering the, school, the already existing school program. Because we have a, pro, a school program on health education that talks about very hard subjects on sex education, starting with the sixth and seventh grades. That means, yeah, but secondary school. So what's the point of being so hypocritical about uh, sex education and uh, stuff like that? We already uh, have the materials. We, we are already functioning in legal manner. Mm -hmm. Therefore, but all we need are some resources and for ourselves to be very, very... I don't know, uh, good in this process of building the, the materials and the training and uh, the resources together with the beneficiaries, because this is another aspect that I didn't mention is that we try to involve the adolescents themselves in doing stuff together with us, because otherwise, hmm. mm -hmm. I think it's partially... we're still piloting uh, this, so... Mm. Thank you. I think it partially answers also Mark question, but maybe you, you can answer this uh, on the chat because we have to move uh, to the next presentation. But Mark posted a very good question. Yes, how it's changed you, us. Yes, uh, how, how, how changed us and it will change changed, because it's uh, about the age. Mm -hmm. It's about Thanks. the age. Thank what you. to do at 10, uh, 10 years old, 12, 14, 16, depending on the school program. That's it. Thank you. Thank so you. we are we are uh, we are moving from one extremely timely and important topic to another one because we are moving from health education to uh, climate crisis and education about 
uh, climate and we are moving from Romania to Philippines and uh, there's already with us um, uh, Mm, already with us, uh, Zerluk Shin Rodriguez, and uh, I hope you can bring us up to date with what's happening in the Philippines in the Department of Education and what great things you are doing with climate education there. All right, thank you so much, Camille. Can you hear me? Uh, can you yes, see me? Yes, we can hear you and see okay. the presentation. So you're good, and I will put the timer on the screen. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, good afternoon and good morning to some of you. My name is um, Zerlakshin Rodriguez from the Department of Education in the Philippines and I will be discussing about climate and green education using open educational resources. As a background, the Department of Education or, uh, or DepEd is the executive department of the Philippine government which is responsible in ensuring access to quality basic education. And in DepEd, you will find the Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Service Office. The DRRMS is the focal in disaster risk reduction and management, education in emergencies in armed conflict, and climate change adaptation and mitigation, which I am a part of. And the DRRMS is anchored on Philippine laws and policies. As the, Dep is, as the DepEd, or Department of Education, is the focal in basic education. It caters to more than 24 million Filipino learners. And that's 24 million Filipino learners that are being exposed to the impacts and effects of climate change. And it's already threatening their well being, survival, and access to services, including education, water and sanitation, nutrition, and health. And with that, we have to put emphasis on climate change education as anchored on Philippine laws on climate change and environmental education, the Department of Education through the Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Service puts emphasis on climate change education. And that means we have to equip more than 900,000 Filipino teachers and increase the awareness of more than 24 million Filipino learners and teachers on climate change and its impact. And this is why we created the microsite, Uncurated Resources on Teaching Climate Change. The microsite was developed to help our teachers on teaching climate change, especially in the new normal. And it is found on the Department of Education official website. The microsite includes the following, supplementary readings, lesson plans, and even videos and online um, activities that they can use. It has six pages. Um, in the home page, you will find an overview of what can be found on the site. The other page is climate change education in the Philippines, which provides, which provides general information on climate change education, uh, particularly the projects that are being done by the Department of Education. We also have a page on references for teachers on climate change topics, which is um, sorted into four categories climate science, climate change in the Philippines, teaching climate change, and even free online courses that, that our educators can access. We also have a page on learning resources, which is categorized into three categories. So lesson plans, videos, and interactive online activities. For the lesson plans, our teachers may use this as an inspiration for their lessons on teaching climate change. The videos were actually created and curated from credible educational channels and other institutions. And we have also included timestamps and even guide questions so that, so that it is easier for them to uh, understand or locate what they need. We also have interactive online activities that are also curated from credible sources, which um, can be used in online delivery. To further help our teachers, we have added APA citations in all our reading materials and resources. And we have partnered with national agencies and civil society organizations to ensure that our um, great resources and references are credible and um, correct. Currently, the Department of Education has an average of more than 1.8 use and about 1 million average sessions per month. And we have also embedded a survey on the microsite to understand if our microsite has been helpful for them. 
and 492 out of 501 respondents answered yes. And we are currently improving our microsite. We are tracking our educators who are using the microsite. We are increasing the number of available references and resources and increasing the awareness of the microsite among educators. And the microsite is just part of the bigger picture that, what, that we do in Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Service. We are currently doing capacity building for our learners and personnel through scientific and multidisciplinary approach. We have already trained learners and personnel on using journalism and even theater arts on, um, to teach about climate change. And some of our trainings can, are done through online. We are also doing uh, devel developing learning resources and even um, drafting policies and enhancing our curriculum. But our bigger goal is not just um, as equipping our learners, but we have to equip them so that they can lead um, climate change adaptation mitigation programs, projects, and activities, and not just become a participant. Because if we equip more than 900,000 teachers to teach climate change, we enable more than 24 million learners and their families to become climate advocates. And that's a big number on climate change. If you want to learn more about our microsite, please visit bit.ly slash depedcce. And uh, you can also message us. So with that, uh, you can also reach us through drrmo plus ccam at deped.gov.ph. Again, that's the link, bit.ly slash depedcce or here in our QR code. So that's it. Thank you so much. Maraming salamat mabuhay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I have to ask you some questions. Uh, although I had an opportunity before be because we've met and I've seen the presentation before. And I think the statement you've made about uh, how making the teachers and the students who are participating in those pro project activists at the end. So they are not only learning, they're part of the solution uh, to come. So I, I, I wanted to ask you if because this is like connecting two levels of policy open policy and open education resources can help solve another higher level problem we are we are dealing with so uh how do you imagine like what's the next step for uh, such a project so you are using and creating open educational resources you are putting them out there via the site and then you are tracking what the teachers are doing with it so it's a huge educational project and the goal is to to make those learners, activists, but what's like the next step you want to achieve? What's the next level of education about climate crisis and the solutions in Philippines? Okay, um, currently in the in DepEd, our Department of Education in the Philippines, we have a series of action plans and we have a roadmap that we want to follow. And first is equipping our learners and personnel. So, and on the personal level, we are currently developing a, an online training and to be developed into an, an, a MOOCs so that they can be trained, so we can reach and be, they will not just be using the microsite as a, as a resource, but they are already equipped to properly teach climate change on their subjects. So you can use math and incorporate and integrate climate change in their subjects, so you, you can you can also, uh, so that's one of our goals. Next is our learners. We are training and uh, capacitating our learners so that they can um, participate. So currently in DepEd, we have a nationwide um, activities, including the celebration of National Climate Change Conference uh, in celebration of the National uh, Climate Change Consciousness Week. And those trained learners, they are actually participating to become um, Part of the press team, official press team, because they were trained on environmental journalism. We are also inviting our learners to become to be part of the event. And some of our activities itself are already planned and participated with them. So on a higher level, we also want to invite our learners to be involved in planning our um, uh, plans for climate change education and uh, in the higher level. So that includes our three-year plan, but that's in the future. Uh, we are still developing and moving towards that direction. Thank you. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed and I 
I just hope for other ministries of education, other countries uh, got inspired from such an involvement in the topic of uh, climate change as the uh, Department of Education in the Philippines is. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing the update from, from Philippines about that. And uh, just to uh, give another number, because you've showed that there are 24 million of students in your country, and uh, I think it's less than 1 million of teachers. So like the scale you're dealing with is, uh, is, is huge. Uh, and for other countries, you can, you can take your numbers of how many students and teachers you have per, per country uh, to compare that. Thank you again. And we are moving to another presentation. Uh, we are jumping from country uh, to another. We are going right now to uh, Mumbai to visit uh, University of Mumbai and Sibyl, Dr. Sibyl Thomas is uh, hopefully with us and she will share, your pre share her presentation about uh, MOOCs as well. So I think this topic is uh, getting another traction after a few years because of the remote education. And I hope she will give us an update on, on her project as well. Uh, is Sybil with us? Uh, yes, yes, I am oh, there. Amazing, yeah. good to see you again. Yes. The floor is Thank yours you. and we already see your presentation. Uh, you can just turn the full screen and I will turn the timer on. Yes, Thank you. So uh, friends, this presentation is based on my experiences of developing a MOOC under the project of the Open Education for a Better World. We had uh, launched this MOOC course at the University of Mumbai from 5th August to 20th August. Uh, the title of our course was Education for a Just, Peaceful and Inclusive Society was the course title that we had uh, developed it. And myself being from the Department of Education, University of Mumbai, who had a brief exposure to the concept of open education as well as MOOC, etc., was post um, developing a MOOC was only post the lockdown, though theoretically and uh, being part as a, as a participant or a student of different courses, but uh, definitely to evolve and build courses began in the time of the pandemic when we all went online. So these are a few brief uh, reflections on our experiences, on my experiences with this course on education for a just, peaceful and inclusive society. We had conceptualized certain learning outcomes as a course developer. And firstly, it was to develop the cognitive readiness to even identify, discuss and reflect and contribute to this whole concept of um, um, education for just, equal, uh, peaceful and inclusive society. We wanted them to engage and interact effectively, evolve their own understanding, explore a wealth of perspectives, engage with open pedagogy and reflect on various attributes of open pedagogy. And therefore, we had for this course the different aspects that we thought was reflecting an open pedagogy and the opportunities for them to engage with them was to see we tried to enhance innovation and creativity to the different e tools and the triple P A format that is prepared, present, and um, assess format. We had tried to do connected communities developed through the discussion forum, comments, suggestions, sharing of ideas and resources was there, people, openness, trust. We wanted to enhance and as well as participatory technologies were there, but opportunities through asynchronous activities as well as reflective practice, peer review in think and share, et cetera. So uh, we also tried to give them a closing challenge to discuss their, uh, their, to reflect their learnings on their learnings and share their learnings with us. So these were some of the modules that we had uh, prepared the uh, MOOC based on two modules that we had and uh, the titles are given here. We had advertised for this course on various uh, WhatsApp groups that we had in the university with our alumni as well as with teacher educators. We had a registration of 312, but at the, uh, in the first three weeks, we saw we had a, a, the course attempt, the number of participants that attempted the course was only 14. Okay, 
We then see that the participants, we did a pre-survey to understand their expectations from this course. And we saw that um, some of their expectations of the learners were to generate, they wanted to generate new in-depth knowledge. They wanted to explore open pedagogies. Many of them were curious to know about the SDG 4 and how does this topic lie under the SDG 4, about the format that we said, the design that uh, we have using for preparing the MOOC course, what is an OER, et cetera, were some of the expectations that they had expressed from uh, by being a part with us. Now let's look at some of the perceived takeaways. Firstly, they said they developed insight into complex concepts, especially concepts where we struggle in the understanding of how education is relevant for creating multicultural societies and how through pedagogies and classroom interactions, we are able to see what is inclusion, what is social exclusion, and how is multiculturalism being, uh, can be fostered in classrooms, etc. They also said that uh, they benefited by enhancing their knowledge of concepts like these, confidence, they said, in building multicultural and peaceful societies and how they could see their own role as instruments to create, a, uh, to create social inclusive classrooms. We see that uh, they also said that after the course, they were committed to using multiple teaching methods, accepting different perspectives, even in interactions during the classroom. And also how they, they, uh, they another important takeaway was how they would contribute to development of creative and thoughtful individuals rather than, um, you know, um, individuals where we really uh, go away from us with content, knowledge, but how can we enhance their creativity and thoughtfulness? Now, we also see that with regard to um, their commitment to creating just, peaceful, and inclusive societies, they said they would want to celebrate differences, appreciate cultural differences, especially coming from India and the city of Mumbai, though we had some participants beyond Mumbai as well from the state of Maharashtra, but how the, this diversity that we see is, so, is uh, very strong in the kind of... Uh, urban as well as the suburban sites of the city. They also um, committed to exercise reflection on their own practice and to be open to multiple viewpoints and create inclusive environments. Now, after we see this kind of a course, I thought I must share my own reflections and certain areas which I think I would have to really, this being a, probably a sample or a, a pre-pilot course that we launched and how do I work from here on based on the kind of feedback. Is secondly, many of them said that a more of audio, which, uh, audio video resources who should be, could have enhanced their uh, participate, their interest and motivation. And I, that's what even I felt, though I did use, but I think I need to work more on that. Now, it, though it, this course was in the asynchronous mode totally, we see that um, the teacher's presence, as I reflect back on this journey the, of creation and this short implementation experience that I had, that for many of them, the teacher's presence during or constantly on the platform was something that they wanted to be enhanced. They, uh, we see that motivation, lack of motivation to complete the course, to see right, right through from the beginning pre-survey to the closing challenge was also something that uh, I feel I need to probably uh, work more on that. How do I help them to be self-motivated? And also I see that there was a lack of understanding in using MOOC as well. There was an insufficient course duration, of course, that even three weeks probably that they thought I could enhance and keep it more open. And therefore, the capacities even for managing these courses that I need to really um, uh, consider and we need to consider at our university. Peer interactions and discussions as well. Now, from these kind of sharings, I thought I would talk about some kind of recommendations from my experience. And firstly is an awareness of constru constru uh, constructivist methodology with where under this heading, I thought that they need to be well-defined and clarified roles 
clarified roles with regard to what could be a teacher's role and uh, or a facilitator's role and what is the role and expectations that we have from a student as a part of a MOOC uh, program and how do we how is it different from the expectations we would probably have from learners in a synchronous you know online classroom that kind of clarity and uh, of roles it would be required there would also mean uh, how do we then you know uh, bring down the probably at our university level uh, etc as to how do we foster the capacities of teachers who are developing these courses to be able to constantly devote time to guidance and to make a presence known in the presence felt as a part of the learner's journey. The resources, more audio resources, as I said, how do we promote motivation? How do we uh, you know, um, help them, uh, motivate them to take this to completion? And how do we stimulate that kind of self-learning? Because the readiness on the part of the learner to engage in self-learning is also something that we need to prepare mindsets of the communities of learners for that. How do we create awareness of open education? Sadly, and I was very happy to be a part of the first uh, talk, whereas I think when the statistics, if we probably look at where in uh, the uh, sample that I have uh, with me, 300 people, and those who did not take it to completion as I contacted and tried to conduct interviews with them and find out the reasons for difficulties in completion, I see that there was a lack of even awareness of what open education really stands for. What does it mean to make meaningful connections through an online mode, through a MOOC kind of a courses? And how do you strengthen digital literacy? A very, mm -hmm. uh, very, um, and an example that I would like to quote here is that even if some of them who didn't complete and contacted later that I did last week to find out through an interview, and some of them even told me that they thought they did not log in on the first day, and therefore they uh, there was no point being a part of the course later. So even an understanding of an asynchronous MOOC course needs to be really strengthened and understood by the learner and how do we play our roles for even bringing about that is something. We also need well-framed policies with regard to recognition of learning, mm -hmm. recognizing this as learning and recognizing teachers. Cyril, so, I will have to, uh, so, I will have to, I will sure, have to stop, stop you here. Uh, uh, on the last yes, slide, but I'm so thank you, thank you. Uh, so thankful thank you. for your presentation. And uh, I will just make two points, short points to the presentation, because I think you touched on a few points that we wanted to have on this uh, on this edition of Open Education Policy Forum. Uh, as the previous presentation uh, was talking about climate education, you were showing us how open policy can also be connected via specific courses with uh, sustainable development goals. So thank you, thank you for that. And uh, as you've mentioned, uh, the data is also very important to show how the how big is the scale, what's, what's the impact of it. Thank you for that. And we are kindly uh, going back uh, to the policy. We started with a policy that was um, in a bottom up approach uh, in Canada, and we are going back to those last two presentations, then we'll be back to Werner. But the last two presentations we are planned for today, um, I will invite right now Catherine Cronin from Ireland, from National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in, in Higher Education. And uh, so we started with a presentation on bottom-up uh, approach by students uh, at the university. And I think you will give us uh, some overview of how the policy can work on more national level. So the floor is yours. Thank you for, uh, Thanks for being- so uh, Thanks, Camille. You know, and, time to share that. Um, it's very humbling to sit here. I'm so inspired by all the presentations so far. So thanks to all the presenters so far. It's really wonderful work. I'll try and share my screen. Uh, is this visible now? It works and we hear you. Okay, wonderful. That's great. I might just uh, make sure this is full screen. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, as uh, Camille said, my name is Catherine Cronin and I um, am gonna speak about policy in a time of change. And I'm going to talk about some of the work 
We've been doing it at a national level. I'm based at the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Ireland. And I have a link to my slides here. I've included some um, summary of notes in case anyone um, needs access to those. So um, for anyone perhaps that doesn't know, the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education in Ireland is very briefly a small publicly funded academically led body that leads and advises on the enhancement of teaching and learning in Ireland. And because we are so small, uh, we work, we do all our work through collaboration with, um, we don't say with students and staff or faculty, we say with all who teach, all who learn and all who shape policy um, and practice across higher education. So there's of course, as with any national higher education system, a lot of diversity in our sector in terms of institution type, institution size, their location. So today um, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, collaboration across, you know, all, all that diversity, um, focusing specifically on our work in building open capabilities and supporting policy development. So the, uh, our approach can probably best be described by that it's open, collaborative and systemic. So we work openly, we both model and support um, openness. And we work collaboratively And this. These photographs are really just really metaphors for um, the fact that we work with individuals, we work with program teams, we work with institutions, uh, we work with cross institutional um, teams and partnerships, and we work with the sector as a whole in forming national policy. Um, so central to our approach around openness is that uh, we fund a lot of teaching and learning enhancement projects in the sector. And a requirement of national forum funding is that all resources produced from those projects must be openly licensed. So we also de have developed a set of supports to enable people to meet that requirement. So over the last couple of years, these are just a few of the resources we developed, again, in collaboration with the sector, with, with input from students, from teachers, from library staff, teaching and learning staff, uh, guides for open licensing and choosing an open license uh, for the Irish context. Um, and this year we published um, an online resource about using OER and OEP um, for teaching and learning. We use the term building open capabilities um, specifically, and, and we know that the first um, OER recommendation of UNESCO is about building capacity, but we just have a slight variation on this. And from, for this, we draw on work um, by Helen Beetham in her concept of digital capabilities, which itself draws on Martha Nussbaum's work around the capabilities approach. And really the notion here is of course that capabilities are created by a combination of a person's abilities in their wider context, social, uh, political, economic, educational. So uh, the umbrella for all our work is around what we consider building open capabilities um, in higher education. Um, I have links to some other work we have here that's related to open courses and a national resource hub of what we are. Um, and I don't mean to say that it's only the National Forum who does work in this area of building open capabilities. There's an enormous amount of work done within institutions in the sector. So I just point to a few here um, and I invite anyone who's here engaged with those projects to please um, you know, put your links in the chat because um, I'd like to highlight those. So what about policy? This is supposed to be all about policy. Um, I, I used some of my seven minutes to talk about building open capabilities because we see that as foundational to our policy work. It's really impossible to do policy work without it. Um, and we're so we're informed by what's going on in our sector, but also the international policy context and research. So I've mentioned UNESCO already, um, the, the Open Education Policies Guidelines for Co-Creation by Leo Haverman, who's here, Javier Atenas and others, uh, a number of different pieces of work. I want to highlight one. I know Glenda Cox was here earlier. I'm not sure if she's still here, but the outcomes from the roar for d project, um, Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams, per Patricia Arinto and others, if we accept that the goal of open education is quality education that is participatory, inclusive and equitable, and what factors influence um, OER engagement um, and, and, the, the, and the associated levels of social inclusion. Um, and that is what this um, figure from the conclusion of the roar for d project shows. Um, and you'll note here that um, the importance of institutional policies um, and, the, and the importance of creating supportive social and institutional environments. So it's a linchpin, in fact, for um, realizing um, the potential benefits of open education. 
Um, we also have evidence from our sector. We know that um, what we, as we say, a lack of appropriate OER and IP and related open policies speaks very loudly to people. So in the absence of policy, we will not see the full realization of open. So we've been facilitating a national conversation for the past two years um, to create a new guide for the Irish HE context um, for developing enabling policies. And this is institutional policy specifically. And we are trying to bring to the broader conversations around digital teaching and learning um, issues around the open web and about open and how open practice affects and is affected by other digital policies. So we're not just speaking to the open education people, we're like moving in to speak under the, the digital teaching and learning umbrella as well and trying to inform those discussions. So in my last few seconds, um, our guide will be published at the end of September. I'm sorry that it's not published today. I will give a link uh, on the next slide. But, but just to give you an idea, emerging from the sector, from students, faculty, staff, and others, we have um, come up with our own definition of what an enabling policy is in terms of content, process, and form. So in process, of course, it's collaborative, it builds on existing um, structures around student and staff partnership, which is really important in Irish higher education, um, diverse, um, processes which are inclusive and equitable are, are key. Um, and then the process itself focuses on collaboration, co-creation and um, communication. So the new guide will be published at the end of September. I really look forward to learning from all the partners here today um, and keeping the, the conversation going. Um, and the link there will, will, will bring you to all of our related work. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, if you can stay with us, because I already have questions, other questions that I did not come up with when we were talking before, uh, talking about the presentation today, because your title was mentioning the policy in times of change. And uh, at least in Poland last year, uh, shown us that the higher education was unprepared for rapid change that was coming from, uh, from the times of pandemic and remote education was happening much faster in lower uh, levels of education and schooling. At a higher level, uh, it was seen sometimes like we, we they, they were lacking, like higher education institutions, they were lacking policies for change. So like policies that they would allow them to do something in more agile way. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see something that could come up with th from those policies in Ireland that would be uh, enabling also more agile changes in the institutions because of those open policies they could implement on national and institutional yes. level? Yes, we do. And as I said, although it was, I, I described it briefly, but um, many institutions found that their existing policies were insufficient to address the needs, you know, in, in this period of kind of emergency remote teaching during the time of the pandemic, or that they didn't have policies at all to address the challenges that they were facing. Students were asking, say, for lecture recordings or um, more responsiveness in terms of digital assessment, um, different kinds of digital assessment and so on. So we, again, we are trying to expand the umbrella where people are talking already about digital teaching and learning and calling this digital and open because some of the biggest issues are around um, you know, anything that's digital can be open and the challenges that we face there. So people who may not have been part of open policy or open education discussions before, we're, we're, let, we're kind of leveraging that into discussions around digital and we're finding that's really fruitful in terms of, you know, kind of raising awareness and kind of expanding the, the conversation. I, I think a lot of open policies started from being a part of a digital policies in many countries and in many levels of how we wanted to change the education uh, many years ago. So I think that connection still works and it's a good good point. Some, some, somehow happened by the, by the need for a remote education very fast. Thank you, Catherine, uh, again for your presentation and we are, uh, we are looking forward for the final uh, publication in the end of September. And uh, as you've mentioned, we are, uh, we are also looking up for another presenter who will be giving us some kind of an overview of what's happening in uh, open policy, not in terms of what's happening around the world, rather in what's happening around different ideas and topics that open policy is covering in last uh, years. So Leo Havelman, uh, thank you for, for having time and thank you for having amazing background as I always appreciate <laughs> amazing backgrounds, uh, both virtual and real one. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, again, lovely to see you here as uh, lovely to see Catherine. And uh, 
Now uh, we are waiting for your presentation and then uh, just to make a point to people who, who lost, we will be going back to Werner Westermann for the last few minutes. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Camille. And thank you so much for um, having me here. Um, it's a joy to, um, to again be, be part of the Open Education Policy Forum. Um, and um, and my, um, my topic as Camille introduced is um, a bit of a landscape view on uh, open education policy making. Um, and um, I've been thinking a bit about this idea of, of, of landscape and, um, and maps and territories. So I decided to call this, um, the map is not the territory. And um, the phrase the map is not the territory is kind of one that gets um, quoted and echoed um, every, every so often. And I thought, well, I don't really know where this comes from. And I had a look and it actually comes from a Polish American scientist and philosopher, Alfred Korzybski. Um, and I really like this phrase because it reminds us that it's hard to know reality, that whenever we simplify and summarize the real and make a representation, um, we remove so much and we select so little. And what we're doing is saying, trust me, I selected the most important things. But actually we are dealing with what has made it through someone's filter. What they consider unimportant is important to someone else. And they may not even be able to see the things that are the most important to someone else. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to th um, think about this in relation to policy making um, with this idea in mind, because making policy is some, in some ways like making a map that's supposed to show you how to get from here to there. But sometimes the policy map we make is of a little known or unseen territory. Oops. Don't want to go, don't want to go too far. Um, as you can imagine, trying to follow a map that doesn't adequately represent the territory you're trying to move through can interrupt your journey. Um, and you may find yourself unable to proceed and, and turning back. Uh, so in my current PhD research, I'm interested in particular in the local policy making that we do in higher education institutions, um, for example, but I think that this has, um, has a, a wider relevance as well. And the relationship between policy and practice there on the ground and between that policy level and uh, national and supranational levels. And one of the ways of, um, of looking at this is um, as a pyramid, this is a, um, a graphic that um, Javier Atenas and I designed um, to think about um, a, a policy pyramid where we've represented how the pieces, um, how we hope the pieces are gonna fit together. Um, so rather than, um, uh, putting the supranational and international level on top with policy directives kind of cascading down. We prefer to think of this as a, as a robust foundation that supports the policy and practice that's getting layered on top. Um, and in this view, the national policy should sit in between the foundation and the institutions, and mo most importantly, really the people who do the work in, in the institutions, the national level. It's really important though, the, 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 the level in between, because this is, where a lot of the important policy decisions about allocating money um, are being made. And so what we've seen so far in um, investigating the landscape of policies that exist um, through a lot of work that, uh, that Javier and I have done, particularly with the uh, Open Education Policy um, Hub, um, which is part of the um, Open Education Resources World Map project, um, is, um, is that we have um, a, a lot of work as taking place at the supranational and international levels with um, recommendations, declarations. Um, here we can also mention the work of researchers feeding in um, to, the, to these visions, um, these recommendations and guidelines. Um, also the work of foundations that are funding important initiatives. Um, and we've also seen a huge amount of work at the level of institutions and people. Um, and so there are certainly a small group of institutions which lead the way which have put policy and resourcing in place and where work is ongoing to make open education a mainstream element of practice. Um, and then particular pockets of people within other institutions who are doing amazing work, although there may be gaps in the institutional policy and resourcing. Um, and, and what we think here is what would um, most likely activate a lot more activity at the institutional levels would be stronger commitment, not least in terms of unlocking those vital funding streams at national level or you know, also states or similar subnational um, governmental levels. I think progress here is the slowest um, because there still isn't a really strong understanding or awareness of open education. Um, and, and we even see this with colleagues working in educational institutions that they, they might know about OER but not have a, a 
bigger depth of knowledge about a, a kind of wider concept of open education. So I think gaining traction with those national policy makers is difficult and it's a slow process, but we, we shouldn't necessarily be surprised that it's, it's slow. Um, and, and certainly we do have countries which are further along in embracing and supporting open education and working on specific aspects of it. Um, but um, but we, we, we still have yet to see it becoming internationally a kind of core um, agenda item and budget line, I think. So in terms of thinking about making policy and if you're wanting to make policy at the, at the local level, there, here are some things that I think are, um, are important. Um, so policy talk quite often focuses a lot on the desired products and outcomes. Um, so for example, um, open educational resources and MOOCs. And sometimes this is at the expense of the practices and the processes that underpin, um, underpin um, those kind of results that people want to see. Um, so the idea of open educational practices, um, which is such a um, key point from um, the work of um, Catherine Crowley and the previous speaker, um, practices that work to open up aspects of education in different ways can seem quite complex to communicate. But I think without developing awareness of this at policy making level and building capacity in those kind of practices, we will really struggle to achieve the outcomes that policy talks about. And one of the key areas I'm referring to really is, um, for example, educators' participation in professional networks where they um, share resources, but also experiences, reflections, questions, and advice. And, um, and through this practice, they can increase their capabilities in digital and open practices that they'll be able to use when they're teaching. Uh, so I think it's important to, to note education realities are local, different and evolving. And here by local, I mean all the layers that from the, 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 the country, what kind of educational technical infrastructure is available there um, to the institution and the students that it serves, the subject area and the kinds of practices and resources that are relevant. And as we've seen in the context of the pandemic, everything can change overnight. Although the pandemic change was more obvious because it was very sudden and dramatic, um, change is a, is a constant. Um, but I'm not suggesting that open education suddenly became needed because of the pandemic. It was, it was already needed, it was always needed. The pandemic has just exposed those fault lines in our normal, um, normal ways of doing things and magnified the inequalities, I think. Um, in the pandemic, we definitely saw that higher education would have been more resilient to the impact of moving classroom-based teaching online if open resources and practices were already much more mainstream. Um, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll keep this short, but just a, a small example is that one colleague that I worked with prior to the pandemic, um, we had designed an approach for her course, which involved the students supporting their peers, developing their assignments um, and reflections on the process via blogs. And, um, and my colleague was really impressed that there was very little adjustment to to run in this course needed in the pandemic context. It, it really um, worked just about the same. And the students um, really valued how they were, the, the peer work element meant that they, they had a reason to have these regular check-ins that became kind of well-being check-ins for them with their peers, as well as for working on the, on the assignments. And so that was a much valued source of support during the isolation of lockdown. Um, I think another um, key area that, that where we're seeing the pandemic has uh, raised awareness and made an impact is um, that, that in, the, in the UK context is that people are now seeing the appeal of open textbooks in a way that they didn't necessarily before. Um, and um, this has been because the pandemic was seen by publishers as a huge opportunity to massively increase um, ebook prices um, and causing a real, real strain on library budgets. And so librarians have um, taken to campaigning, a big grassroots campaign via Twitter using the ebook SOS hashtag, um, and that's really worth um, checking out. Um, and I think that's been raising institutional awareness on how much money we're actually spending that we could be allocating potentially um, in, in different ways, maybe towards um, open practices and open resources. Um, so that's, um, I think, you know, really uh, interesting. So for more information, um, do please check out our guidelines for co-creation of um, open education policies. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, it's been a pleasure and uh, very interesting. Thanks. Thank Kate. you. I've, I've already uh, posted the link to the research you've mentioned, so uh, I encourage all the uh, audience members to, to visit it. And Leah, I have one question. 
you've made a great point uh, in the, in the last few few slides about uh, the policies that they often uh, uh, overvalue the outcomes over practices. And I wanted to ask you if you, from your perspective, from the research perspective, and I'm uh, thinking about the first presentation, first lighting talks, and the uh, involvement of students in the policy at UBC that uh, the Kristen mentioned. Uh, do you see, or maybe you have some ideas, recommendations, how this involvement of stakeholders should be happening? Like, what are the best practices that uh, this could be uh, encouraged and made uh, easier for uh, for those who are doing uh, open policies to uh, encourage and invite stakeholders to do such work together, not do something that like only envisioned the outcomes, the best outcomes, and not looking at the practice, not looking at the stakeholders that much? Well. I guess you know if this if this was really really easy, then maybe um, people would be would be already doing it much more. Um, but 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 I but I hope that um, you, you know the the awareness is growing that actually it's really important to involve all the stakeholders to in it, to in order to um, in order to get a get a sense of that territory that you're trying to make a map of. Um, so, so in, in other words, to really kind of understand the practices, to understand why people do things the way that they do, what would encourage them to do different things. Um, I think that this, this really requires kind of everybody who's involved to, to have a voice in the development of policy. Um, the, the, I think it's, it's great to know what, what kind of outcomes you're working towards, but also um, how do you really know that you're working towards the right outcomes unless you've consulted the, the people who are supposed to be the, the beneficiaries? And I do think when, I hope when you highlight um, the involvement of students, I think that's really, um, really key. Uh, and, um, and, and students also have been um, become increasingly involved in the, in the making of open resources as well. This is, a, I think, a, a really a big, a big trend where um, a lot of student work is about the the production of their own resources rather than being just simply consumers of um, an open textbook rather than of a commercial textbook. So, um, so yeah, students, it's all about students really. Thank you. Uh, uh, we, will, we will end uh, on this uh, point that it's all about the students. So it's all about the, the users of the resources we want to help create by open policies. It's all about them at the end and the teachers as well, of course. And with that, we've come out somehow not to the end, but almost to the end. Uh, Werner, uh, you're back with us. We've seen this alert on your screen that the battery was running low and we were with Anahita so afraid we were talking on the chat, private chat. If he make it, will he make it to the, uh, the presentation or not, but you lost the, the power. We are great uh, to see you. It's great to see you back. And uh, you still have a few minutes left, uh, five minutes, I think, uh, to finish the presentations. And uh, of course, you will have a question from me, at least one. Uh, good to see you. And the floor is, uh, floor is yours. Oh, I'm so sorry. Just like you said, uh, it was totally my fault about the... Uh, uh, I don't see I have a screen share. Um, Give us a second. Capability. You should you should have Werner because you are still a co-host. So um, just making sure, yes, you are co-host. So you, you has you have oh, to be okay, able yes. to make a screen sharing. Here we go. Great. So um, I'm sorry for the, the disruption, and uh, I'm I feel blessed to to talk after Leo and and Catherine. My some of my open education heroes. So a big hug to you, miss you all. And so um, just a quick wrap up. We have a big problem related to connectivity and, and uh, OER gives us the possibility to create uh, offline resources in, in, in a very efficient way. Uh, first of all, we need openness of those resources to adapt them towards a, uh, uh, um, an offline uh, delivery modality. So uh, we have this big problem of uh, connectivity and we have a solution based on, on this wonderful tool called Calibri, which is, is more than just a learning platform where uh, teachers and learners interact with uh, offline OER, but it, 
you can create these all OER channels through a content library, which is a very big source of OER. Uh, although there's a lot of uh, OER in English, much less, much less in Spanish. So, um, but we have very rich and, and high quality content there that we can reuse and we can uh, create these offline streams or these offline channels of offline OER through the Colibri Studio, which is a, a web-based platform, which uh, uh, allows collaborative uh, co-creation, uh, uh, which is something very important as uh, Leo has uh, remarked. And, um, and not only I can reuse OER through the, the Colibri Studio, and select whatever I might need in my channel. You can also import new OER. Uh, and if and if that not suits you, you can also create OER and upload it to the Colibri. So it, it, it kind of covers the different permissions that open education uh, harnesses is in the five R's. Um, you can reuse content, you can remix content through Colibri. So what we did was uh, uh, we built a full K-12 OER channel around math uh, going from first to 12th grade. Uh, we, we selected two, more than 2,100 uh, resources, which gave us 100% curricular coverage, which was awesome for us. Uh, we didn't expect that we were gonna cover the whole curriculum. Um, so we did have this 100% uh, curricular coverage, although there's disparity between uh, uh, different areas in math. We have a scarcity, for example, around ge geometry and statistics. So there's a lot of work to be done uh, still. And especially around, uh, we are in Spanish where we are really f lagging behind of uh, to have a, a critical mass of OER so we can reuse and. And, and deliver it to, to our institute. This OER, offline OER channel, uh, we presented to the Ministry of Education and, and they, um, they allowed, uh, they, they promoted. First of all, um, Colibri was already installed in, in, some, in access points. They, they call it content access point where you have, it was like a small server where you could access to different uh, educational materials. So we loaded the, uh, to these uh, rural schools, 500 rural schools uh, will um, have access to this OER channel that we, um, that we uh, developed. And uh, also there was a, a, an offline repository, uh, which also are, and this went to the local government schools, which are our public schools, but they are run not by a national, but, uh, but uh, by local governments. So uh, that's about a third of, uh, of the total schools in Chile. So, so we're very happy to, to get this, the, the, um, to get this uh, offline OER solution delivery through the Ministry of Education. And then we got the invitation to work around uh, Honduras, which uh, gave us another context very differently to, to uh, continue this curriculum alignment so we can provide offline resources to those that come from unconnected contexts or low tech uh, contexts. But what's all had this have to do with uh, policies? Um, I think this, this case that I'm presenting is very interesting because it tackles issues around infrastructure. Um, we have talked prior to this, related to the, the, the need of infrastructure. I really like the um, Alex comment around that the infrastructure is like having a place that we safe. And, and in fact, uh, we need to deploy in our policies uh, a robust infrastructure so we can unleash the potential of open education. And I think, first of all, we need, we need content that we can see it here in the Colibri uh, library. We need high quality content. We need other tools where we can administrate and we can manage, we can steward that content and, and those resources. And I think the Colibri Studio is just a, 
awesome place where you can arrange, where you can co-create with others. And you create these offline OER channels um, so they can be loaded to, this, to, to, to the Calibri learning platform and uh, really get to the teachers and learners, which is the final, the, the final objective of, of our initiative. So we, can, we have to uh, promote infrastructure, whether it's content and a set of tools and environments and platforms they can really, and we also need enablers for that, which are also part of the, the infrastructure. First of all, we need an open, open licensing framework. So we, it's like to have the legal infrastructure set um, so we don't make any type of criminal acts uh, as we try to remix and, and reuse. And, and you also, and this is very important because we need, when we create collections and we gather different OER, uh, we need to uh, be sure that we're not doing something illegal around it. So if you have that framework, you set well the, the field so, so others can, can hop in and develop the, but we also need open technical standards so the content can be interoperable uh, as much as it, as it can. Uh, we, we had the chance, we, we talked about the scarcity around geometry uh, resources. We found very wonderful uh, resources in GeoGebra, but we had technical issues that couldn't, uh, that we could not uh, import directly uh, these GeoGebra uh, assets to the content libraries and the, and the studio so we can create a, an offline. So we, we have to have this. Uh, and um, this is important because uh, this is uh, um, a guideline that, that I really urge you to, to, to have a look at because um, it, it was developed by UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning and it has this trip, it has these different phases where you can create uh, a policy. And the one in the middle, which is related to gap analysis, overtakes this, this need that we need to think about our users and their cap capacity and their awareness around OER. But we also need very strong infrastructure so we can unleash. And we need good quality content, but we also need regulatory frameworks in the legal side, in the technical side, and we need to provide those in, that infrastructure and technology support so we can uh, get more open education, open educators on our side. Um, this is, I think, very important. The last issue around the, the ICT infrastructure, because as we have talked before, and especially related to K-12 education, which is the kind of field I'm, I'm working on, uh, is that we cannot depend on transnational companies around the data and the works that are Chilean. We need to protect, we as Chilean educators and, and decision makers, we need to provide the protection of the fundamental rights of our children. So we need to embrace and we need to deploy this, this infrastructure. And open source has very, very um, good uh, platforms and and very capable to do the same things that the today's uh, big companies uh, are doing. So for your attention, thank you so much. Uh, I'm very sorry about the disruption and attentive of, of your comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Werner, don't leave us. I have one question and thank you because you brought us uh, back to the, like almost the most important key points from the research that's, uh, that was presented at the beginning, because you've mentioned both the technical issues and the copyright issues as very important parts of the policy that should be at the end working for those students uh, independently from their situation. Are they in need of offline or online education? It doesn't matter. It should be independent from uh, digital or not. The open should be some, about something more than just being able to uh, acquire digital resources. So thank, thank you for that. And to that, I have one uh, one question because you've mentioned the uh, open source tools and Colibri. And I I was testing Colibri a few years ago when I I was in love when I when I came up with uh, what was the idea for the Colibri and I was seeking for for such tools around the world for some time. And uh, 
do you see this international pos potential implementation of such projects? Like you've mentioned that you were in Honduras as well, testing it. Mm, uh, can you see the pandemic and the last year maybe as an, a good opportunity to seek more resources? And if so, what would be the next step of those for those kind of uh, platforms to be implemented on a bigger scale and go outside one country and maybe more useful uh, and usable for other countries as well. So like, is there any plan for that in Colibri or uh, do you have like any ideas how it could be happening in the future? Thank you, Camille. Um, well, the international collaboration is one thing that is very highlighted in the, in the UNESCO recommendations. So in fact, uh, I think there's a lot of potential for international collaboration. And I think this, this specific uh, initiative does that um, because, but what basically what we're doing is we're taking Spanish resources that others built and developed and we're reusing it. We're recontextualizing the, the, re the resources to our uh, context. So I think the, the, the collaboration issue is something that's embedded in open education always. So, um, so in the case of Calibri, uh, I would urge you to, to look at the, the Shoulder to Shoulder Foundation. They are working in Central America, uh, specifically in Honduras, but it's moving on to El Salvador. And this project is uh, supported by the International Development Bank. So um, they are moving to a second country, which is El Salvador, but they're looking ahead uh, to expand to, to Mesoamerica. That's, that is Central America without the Caribbean. So that, that should expand to another 10 countries. And, and it makes a lot of sense uh, for us uh, in, in South America because we have a tremendous potential for collaboration due that we have the same language. So if you look at the geometry resource from Argentina or from Ecuador or from Chile, you will not find uh, much difference around that. Of course, another subjects or another fields of knowledge like history or geography uh, will, will be much different. But there are some other uh, issues that, uh, that, are very, um, that are very well suited for international collaboration. So expect to, uh, that international collaboration will 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 flourish around this uh, the, this initiative. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, and I've mentioned the doc uh, the document and the recommendations from UNESCO on how to implement open policy. So thank you for that as well. I think it will be very useful for uh, our audience here. Uh, and uh, this is the end of the lightning talks. I'm I'm so happy that we've managed successfully. And I'm so happy that we had an opportunity to listen everyone, uh, even though it was remotely. And I, as you know, remote, uh, remote meetings are even more difficult to happen uh, due to connections, technical issues, and, and many other things that could happen, like dogs or kids uh, flying around when you are talking. So uh, thanks to all our uh, Lightning Talks uh, speakers. Uh, and if you can give them applause in your home or office right now, that would be awesome. Uh, they might not hear you, but they will feel this applause, uh, I'm sure. And Anahita, I'm uh, giving you back the, the full control over the, uh, over the meeting uh, right Thank now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camille. And uh, I'm joined to the oldest. Uh, giving the thank to to all of um, our speakers and to your contributor contribution and as simply as that we just have come to an end of our first day of the forum and uh, i hope that it was a very fruitful day end of the day for us, some of us and for some of us the very beginning um, in the end, I just want to uh, thank to a group of people that just help us with their wisdom and uncountable engagement in this forum. Uh, and the round of thanks goes uh, to Angela de Berger from Hewlett Foundation, to Anja Kuliberda as our consultant on the, on the forum, Kamil Szybowski, uh, who uh, managed our lightning talk session, um, Magda Gołębiewska, our communication, promotion, and Canva expert, uh, to Agnieszka Ubańska, our research um, expert on the report, 
and also to our graphic studio, Paper Cont and uh, Alicia Kozba Studio, for making a wonderful visuals uh, for the forum and the for final report itself. And at least, but uh, not at last, but not least, thank to each and every one of you uh, who who have been with us today. And without you, this event wouldn't be would be meaningless. And um, I hope that um, I will see you next year hopefully um please don't forget to follow us on the twitter but also on a facebook and on a youtube um you we will post um at the recorded um full session of today um forum uh, on a youtube and on twitter as well um and that's it thank you have a great night or a great day ahead see you bye bye thank you anahita and camille